Just imagine being children with a front row seat to the life inside the Dixie Mafia, surrounded by scams, hustlers and murderers and with their mother on the fringe of it all. After more than three decades since the murder of Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife Margaret Sherry, an Ocean Springs woman and her sister are digging through documents and articles in an attempt to understand as adults the life they once understood only as children. It's been a difficult and emotional task, and in many ways, it's just now beginning. Right now, we know that uh, the judge and his wife are both murdered. September 14, 1987, Vincent and Margaret Sherry were murdered in their Biloxi home. The hit pulled off by a group of criminals known as the Dixie Mafia over a Lonely Hearts scam run out of Angola Prison in Louisiana to swindle gay men. Vincent Sherry, a circuit court judge and law partner of eventual Biloxi Mayor Pete Hallett, was blamed for taking some of the money that was being funneled through the law firm from the scam. Margaret Sherry, a Biloxi City Councilwoman, also paid the price. The leader of the fraud, Kirksey McCord Nix, who was already in prison for murder. Dixie Mafia leader Mike Gillich Jr. helped to plot the murders. Hey, any comments at all? I'm sorry, I can't at this time. I've got plenty to say, but this is not the time. And Nix's inside connection was LaRae Sharp, his girlfriend who worked in the Sherry Hallett law firm. In this 1990 WLOX interview, Sharp talked about her ties to it all. I had a lot of knowledge about what was going on. Uh, I had some participation um, because of the association that I had. Sharp had two daughters. At the time of the murders, they were 11 and 8 years old, and they had a front row seat to the twisted and sometimes frightening life few people have experienced. One of them still lives on the coast, and her name may sound familiar. I am Heather Eason, and I am Larae Sharp's daughter. Eason is a former teacher and longtime community organizer who began the Comeback Coolers program to help victims of natural disasters. Eason says she is still living with the fallout of her life with her infamous mother. And now, decades later, she and her sister Amy Gilmer are ready to talk. Why do you want to pursue it now? Is there anything in particular that happened? Is it just that it's time? This is one of those things that whether it's selfish or whether it's not selfish, it's just a story that I, to be very honest with you, Mike, it's just something I have to get out of me. You know, I just, I need to, I need to put it down and if somebody pays attention to it, that's fine. And if they don't, that's fine too. I hope that people just see that there are so many sides to a story and that I don't want to use the word victim, but my sister and I fell victim to my mother's wrath of, of, you know, what she was living. At ages 10 and 6, it seemed almost normal for Heather and Amy, even the trips with their mother to Angola, Louisiana State Penitentiary. What was it like growing up in that atmosphere? And at what point in your life did you realize, if you ever did, this is not normal? Um, you know, if I, if I told you that it was, you know, gloom and doom all the time, I would be lying. I mean, there was definitely some of that that kind of happened a little bit later in the trials. But in the midst of all this, in the midst of going to see Kirksey in Angola, I mean, I, I liked going there. I mean, now as an adult, I look at it and I think to myself, why in the heck would you bring your kid there? Early memories are innocent ones, even memories of a murderer. After all, Kirksey Nix provided the family a house in Ocean Springs after Sharp divorced her husband and moved from Chicago. In a lot of ways, I kind of considered as a child, Kirksey, you know, kind of a, a really nice man. You know, I don't want to say like a hero, but he was always very, very kind to my sister and I. He was, you know, he was an artist. He's an artist. He would paint pictures of us and for us, and he would, you know, make things. He was like a craftsman. I mean, you know, and here we were living in his house. I mean, I felt like that he was, I felt like he was a good guy that had probably gotten involved with the wrong people and had made a mistake in his life. There are also fond memories of Mike Gillich who bought the chocolate Eason sold for her school. We'd stop by and see Mr. Mike or whatever, and I'd say, you know, hey, Mr. Mike, I'd have to, you know, look cute, and Mr. Mike, um, would you like to buy World's? He's like, I'll take them all. So he would buy just boxes and boxes and boxes of these things, so much so that I ended up winning a bicycle in sixth grade for selling the most of the most chocolate bars, and it was because he bought most of them. But the innocence would soon disappear. In 1991, Sharp was already in Louisiana State Prison for wire fraud. It was also the year that she was indicted in federal court for her role. 
Eason was just 16, and reality set in particularly around Nick's. When things started going south and the trial started happening, I started feeling very threatened at that point because whenever things started getting real or, you know, people would say, you know, you're a Sherry murderer or whatever, you know, kind of to my mom. And then knowing that this scary person, Kirksey, what he was capable of, what I believed he was capable of, at that point I became fearful. And it wasn't just the criminals that frightened the sisters. I had a lot of anger toward the press. I mean, there was times that, the, that we would walk home from school and we would be filmed, you know, the media would be on our front lawn, you know, and they'd have to call and, and get them off our lawn, probably, I'm sure, looking for mom, but we were walking home from school. You know, I tell people all the time, it, it literally was like living in a movie. You know, when you see, you know, walking in and out of the courthouses with just the cameras on you and the, you know, the sketch artists in the courtroom and things like that. So it was very, um, there was, it was a lot. Just before Sharp went to federal prison for the first time in 1992, Eason no longer had a guardian or a home in Ocean Springs. The school district was about to kick her out. So Eason made a grown-up choice to stay in her high school. So I got married um, at the age of 16, and um, a year and a day later after that, had, had a child. All of this, as you have seen, forced Eason to grow up fast. Gilmer, who was about four years younger, had moved away to live with other members of the family. Both tried to live outside the shadow of the Dixie Mafia, and now three decades later, the sisters are retracing their steps. As you'll learn tomorrow at 10 o'clock, they call their unique upbringing and the scars it caused the people you think you know.